Hello, welcome to episode 4 of the British Culture Albion Never Dies podcast. My name is Thomas, and today I'll be interviewing Kane, who is an English teacher in Fuzhou, China. In the first part, I'll be talking to him about Fujianese culture, the setting where he discusses and talks about British culture. Then I'll be talking to him about how the people of Fuzhou respond to his teaching about British culture. And finally, I'll be asking him for his own ideas about British culture and how they've been informed by living in a different culture, a very different environment for so long. It's a long interview, but I didn't want to split it into multiple parts because the answers he gives build and build and I think lead to a really interesting place. So, please do enjoy listening to Kane as he talks about British culture. Thank you very much, Kane, for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Kane. I'm from the UK, but I've been living in China for uh, well more than eight years now. Um, and I currently live in Fujian province. Wow, wow. That's quite a long time. And it's, and it's a province that many people listening might not know so much about. Yeah, certainly. Um, if you've never been to China, then uh, Fujian's not really on the map, I suppose. Um, just to to help your listeners to place it geographically, if you, I'm sure they probably know where Shanghai is and they'll know where Hong Kong is at the bottom. While in between that is a province called Fujian. It's a mostly rural province, um, but like all provinces in China, it does have some bigger cities. The capital city is Fuzhou, and um, then the more famous city though is Xiamen, which is uh, by the coast. And what's the what's the key highlight? If I visit, what should I go and see? What's what should I try? Well. Actually, I'd say the best thing about Fujian is um, is the nature and the outdoors. I mean, uh, again, if you haven't been to China, I think your image of China will just be these massive mega cities, uh, perhaps a lot of pollution, concrete jungles. And it's not to say that that isn't correct. That's certainly a feature of um, many areas of China. But Fujian is incredibly green and mountainous. Um, and even in the, the big cities like Fuzhou, for example, the capital, you know, it's surrounded almost 360 degrees by beautiful, like lush green mountains. And they're very accessible. Um, so that that I would say is the biggest selling point, I think, of Fujian is it offers you this um, different, different aspect of China, this kind of more outdoorsy, rural, green part of China, which you probably doesn't come to mind when you think of modern China. Wow, you're right. I mean, I've been living here just over five years, but you know, I've been living in this mega city, Shenzhen. So we've got 14 million people here. So the standard image of China, these mega cities has been my life. But of course, China is the size of Western Europe. There's a huge variety here. So you've seen a very different side of China to me. Yeah, definitely. And it's. it's I, I think I've been quite lucky with that. Uh, and when I first moved here, of course, when you live um, anywhere in China, you well, usually you live in a city, right? If, if you're not Chinese mm. and you live in China, you almost certainly live in a city. So even, you know, for me, of course, I live in a city. Uh, and like all Chinese cities, it's lots of high rise buildings. It's quite um, dense. But when I first moved here and I could, you know, walk out on the street and I could see these mountains and they're just incredibly close. I know that sounds perhaps a bit odd, but you see them, you think it's so close. I feel like I could walk there. Uh, I mean, you can't quite walk there, but certainly... Uh, you know, on a scooter or now that we have a metro here, it's very convenient to get to the mountains. And, um, you know, when I first got out onto these mountains, I'd been in China already by that time for about a year and a half, maybe even going on two years. Uh, and I remember the first time I was actually out, you know, up in the mountains, surrounded by the jungle. And it was, uh, it's, it's kind of perhaps cheesy as this is going to sound, it made me think of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. If you remember uh, yeah. all of the scenes in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon where they're jumping from the trees and fighting each other. And it's that kind of old, um, slightly mystical kind of China that you see in the films. It was uh, a lot more like that than it was this kind of modern, um, futuristic type China that I think comes to most people's minds. Oh, that's fantastic. And and you mentioned, actually, now there's a metro. So when you first went, there was no metro. Where I am in Fuzhou, um, it's, it's the capital city of the province, uh, 
as I mentioned, it's not the most developed city, though. The, the, the richest and most famous city is Sharmen, I believe. I mean, I, I may not be exact on that if we're talking mm. about, you know, GDP figures, but certainly the most developed and most famous city in the province is Sharmen. Uh, but Fuzhou is the capital. And when I first came here, there wasn't any metro system. They recently opened the first line, I guess, about two years ago. Now they've now opened a second line. The ultimate plan is to have six lines, I believe. But I think that will you know, take quite a few years. Wow, because... I mean, when I first came to Shenzhen, there were five lines and then they opened a sixth, a seventh, an eighth, a ninth. And I've only been here five <laughs> years. I think where, where you and I grew up in the UK, I mean, the train station was over 100 years old already. And, and that's <laughs> it. That's the train station. You know, these, China develops in a way that where we grew up hasn't. We haven't seen that change. No, exactly. I mean, the, the change has been phenomenal, even in just what is the relatively short period of time that I've been here, the change has been phenomenal. And when I speak to um, people who grew up in this city, or for example, the part of the city that I live in, you would be, you'd struggle to differentiate between the areas of the city. You know, they all just seem like one, mm. um, one big downtown. But the locals, of course, know the difference because they've grown up when the downtown meant the really urbanized area and the other parts of the city were more suburban or even rural. And the area that I live in is an area that if you speak to Chinese people sort of over the age of 35, 40, they remember when this whole area was nothing but fields. You know, there might have been some mm. small markets or something, but it was all low rise buildings, fields. Um, and then, yeah, really within the last three decades, the area of the city that I live in now looks like any other area of modern China, you know, high rise buildings and um, big wide open spaces, metro stations and so on. It is interesting to see it, right? So as kids, we read about in the Victorian era, that's when England went from being an, uh, <coughs> a rural society to being an urban society, the first mm -hmm. majority urban society in the world. And so we saw how London went from all these little villages to one great big mass of greater London. But here in China, we get to see it right in front of us. We see this change. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's playing out in real time. And um, also, you know, the UK had both the, the blessing of the curse of being the first, right? We were the first mm. country to industrialize. China has the benefit of having seen how other countries have done it. Um, and as a result, they've been able to... Uh, one of the things that I think is is quite good here is with urban planning, they seem to plan for the future. So whereas in the UK, we're, we've already been industrialized and, and urbanized for a very long time and now making changes to the, the urban environment of our cities is very difficult. You know, there's a lot of stakeholders that need to be mm. consulted. It's extremely expensive and so on and so forth. Um, China is able to, to build for the future to say, OK, well, look, we know because we know the pattern of how this works, that, you know, the population is most likely going to increase by this much and there are going to be this many new businesses. So we can build this massive three lane road and we can put a metro station here uh, now because we know in five, six years time it will be necessary. Uh, and that's that's, I think, um, something that China has got right. Uh, which unfortunately mm. in the UK, we're not really able to do that, you know, and then we see, for example, with London, where they have to spend so much money and so many years just to open one new metro line, uh, because of the fact that, you know, London itself is already so it, it's done, essentially, it's finished, right? <laughs> Whereas yes. China's still making its cities, you know, and it's interesting, these differences, right? And you've been working a lot in the in the field of kind of teaching about culture. Um, would you like to tell me a bit about the work you've been doing? Yeah, so it was, um, Quite a few years ago now when I started. So, uh, sorry, I don't think I mentioned in my introduction, I'm, I'm an English teacher. I teach English language uh, here in China. Mm. And that's what I've been doing the whole time that I've been here. And it was quite a few years ago, a lot of, not just my students, but a lot of people I'd meet generally would ask me to talk to them about British culture. So I wanted to kind of meet that demand, but I didn't know how to go about it. Of course, I, I discuss it in my classes and so on, but I wasn't quite sure what to give them because it's such a... It's such a broad and also sometimes strange question if somebody says to you, talk to me about British culture or I want to learn about British culture, because you, you have to say, well, what is it exactly you want to learn about British culture? And the interesting mm. thing is the questioner often isn't very sure about what it is they want to learn. You know, so if you're going to teach somebody about British culture, you have to start to think about, well, what is it that they that they want to know or what might they benefit from knowing? <clears throat> so I decided to to go down that path of trying to to teach more um, and help people to understand more about British culture. So I set up a WeChat subscription account, which um, for your viewers or listeners, sorry, who aren't in China, you might not be familiar. It's 
if you imagine something like in between a blog and a Facebook page, that's kind of what a WeChat subscription account is. WeChat is the main form of social media that's used in China. It's also uh, a messaging service. And a WeChat subscription account is a bit like a blog, but it comes directly to your phone. Uh, so I set up this WeChat subscription account to help people learn about and understand British culture in a more nuanced and perhaps more holistic way than what they might have already learned about from their textbook, which is just the kind of really headline stuff, you know, Shakespeare, Big Ben, etc. Mm. Well, that's really interesting. And yeah, I've been following this account for a long time. And I know that you've Thank also you. been involved with other players, right? So you've been involved with local television as well, right? <clears throat> yeah. So as um, off the back of that subscription account, I started by writing articles. Um, and then from the articles, I also, I also made a few videos about British culture. And this, in a in a strange series of ways, as these things always happen, um, it this ended up with me actually making some videos for a local film studio. Uh, but that was actually to do with um, my experiences as a foreigner of Chinese culture rather than mm. being about British culture. So the videos I originally started making with a local filmmaker um, just for fun were about British culture. But this ended up with me working with a local film studio, making some videos about my experiences as a foreigner of Chinese culture. Well, that's really interesting, right? The the, the two-way dialogue. So you teaching them about China and then... <clears throat> Sorry, you're teaching them about the UK <laughs> and yeah. them kind of asking about what you feel about <clears throat> China. And you're right. People ask me, you know, can you teach me about British culture? And I say, well, what do you want to know? And they say, oh, just anything. <laughs> yeah. What, specifically? Well, uh, food. food. That's the <laughs> one that they often go to. They want to know about food. Oh, yeah. Um, OK, yeah. then I have to ask you, what do they think of British food? How do they? Well, uh, well, there's a lot of stereotypes, uh, but I think I don't think that's unique to Chinese people's opinions of British food. I think there's a lot of stereotypes <laughs> all over the world. I'm not sure why. I mean, we have many great dishes, and I back in the UK, I had many foreign friends that enjoyed British food. But it seems the only the only thing that's known outside of the UK is fish and chips. Perhaps I mean, not even even a full English breakfast is people know about it, but rarely do people know what it is. Um, but it's a it's a fantastic meal, of course. I can't remember who it was. I want to say Ernest Hemingway, but it may not have been him. But there was a famous author. I'll have to look it up. Who said, if you want to eat well in England, eat uh, breakfast three times a day. Uh, you know, because it's obviously <laughs> it's, it's great meal that we have, uh, which more people should be aware of. But yeah, as for as for teaching about culture, it was a it's been a fun and an interesting experience because I've been interested in culture for a very long time, I think since my, my early 20s, I suppose, in, in, in the sense that I've really wanted to learn and understand about other cultures, you know, not, not just on a superficial level. But the question I think immediately comes up when you start, when you, when you say, I want to know more about Japanese culture, or I, I'm interested in French culture, you know, the question comes, well, what is culture, you know, and mm. what do I mean by I want to understand Japanese culture or Chinese culture? And those are very difficult questions, but I think they're questions that you have to engage with if you want to make any progress <clears throat> in understanding the culture more. So I was able to apply that sort of mindset to my project, let's call it, of teaching British culture um, to Chinese people, because I had to ask myself, well, what, what is British culture? What does that mean? And I think for me personally, and I'm certainly not saying that this is a, you know, um, the final answer to the question, but for me personally, uh, when I talk about understanding or learning about culture, what I mean is, what is it like to be a British person living in the UK? What are your experiences mm. of culture day to day? You know, um, and that's what I wanted to try to convey to to people here. So rather than just the the kind of big headline things like Shakespeare or the Houses of Parliament, which are absolutely a part of British culture, but what is it like to be, you know, uh, a young teenager living in in Manchester, for example, right? What are your experiences of British culture if you are that person? Or, you know, what are your experiences of British culture if you're an elderly Scottish person, right? Um, so that's yeah. what I wanted to look at. And that's why I tried to create my articles, not necessarily to show... Um, it wasn't a sort of thing of like, oh, you think you know about British culture? Well, actually, you don't. That's That was never my intention. But I wanted to show this more broad um, representation of what British culture is. And importantly, what's it actually like to live the culture? You know, I mean, mm. for example, Shakespeare, I... I, you know, I'm a big fan of um, Shakespeare's work. I've, I've also taught, uh, lectured on the plays of Shakespeare. So 
Don't think that I'm trying to say Shakespeare isn't important, quite the opposite. But the reality is, for many Britons, Shakespeare doesn't play a big role in their life or experience of British culture. Um, and to the extent that Shakespeare does play uh, a part in their their experience of British culture, it's usually in the use of idioms, you know, um, to wear one's heart yeah. on Steve, for example. It's not actually in any sort of... Uh, the vast majority of Britons aren't going to watch Shakespeare plays, right? <laughs> and, you know, they're probably yeah. not even watching film adaptations of Shakespeare plays. So I was interested in showing Chinese people what is it actually like to be a British person and live British culture, you know? Um, and likewise, that's been what I've tried to understand about China uh, as, as a non-Chinese person here. Um, there are lots of things about Chinese culture which I find really, really interesting and exciting. But... My main interest has always been, well, what is it like to actually be a Chinese person today? And what are the experiences of Chinese culture for a, you know, quote unquote, normal Chinese person? That's very, very interesting. And yeah, it's interesting that some of the things like high culture of Shakespeare, it starts to become subconscious. We use it in idioms and many people might not be aware <coughs> that to wear one's heart on one's sleeve comes from Shakespeare. So it gets embedded in the culture at quite a deep level. It's only when you study, you start to draw these things out of what does it, does it affect us? Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and as I said, I wasn't trying to um, downplay Shakespeare's uh, mm. influence on our culture. But that's what I personally find more interesting. You know, when, when people say talk about Shakespeare and his relationship to British culture, they might be just thinking about, you know, his plays. Um, oh, do, Brit do a lot of British people read Shakespeare? Do a lot of British people watch Shakespeare's plays? Well, the reality is no, not really. Once you leave mm. high school, that's about it for most <laughs> British people. However, you know, every time you speak and you use these idioms, you know, or every time um, you, every time there's a film made in the UK and or a TV show, and it's about you know two two star-crossed lovers from opposing families, you're just watching a, you know, a, a new adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Um, and that's, I think, a lot more interesting and is more representative of how British people actually experience these kinds of famous aspects of British culture than just, for example, talking about, you know, going to the theatre or, um, you know, or, or something like that. Again, really interesting, and you're, you're dead right about that being the experience of most English people, are... The Chinese people who you teach, are they surprised by this? How do they how do they react to this kind of thing? Um, yeah, over the the years of being here, I've certainly encountered uh, people who have quite strong ideas of, of what British culture is and um, often not always the most accurate ideas. I, I guess this is a problem or maybe not a problem, but I guess this is uh, common for many people all over the world when thinking about or learning about a country that they haven't been to is that you have a certain idea which you perhaps have come to as a result of watching some films or some tv or perhaps talking to somebody who went to the country once and then you you take this idea and you you imagine that it can be generalized to the entire population uh so quite a lot of the students that i've met have these quite fixed ideas about what the uk is and about british culture and they're not always so accurate i mean some of the more funny ones I can remember, uh, I remember talking to, uh, I was actually having dinner um, and there was a girl there and she say, said to me, uh, I can't remember exactly what we were eating, but rice was part of the, the, the meal, right? And she said, oh, have you ever eaten rice before? And obviously I've eaten rice before. I was like, yeah, I've eaten rice. <laughs> and she said, I, I, I didn't think you had rice in the UK. And I was like, no, we, we have rice. We have lots of rice you know, dishes. Um, and she said, I thought you only ate potatoes. And I assumed she meant perhaps potatoes are your staple food, you know, in the same way that rice is the staple food of um, southern China. So I said to her, do you mean that we always have potatoes with with our meals? And she said, no, I thought you only eat potatoes. And I had to clarify with her, you mean, so you thought British people only eat potatoes, no other vegetables or meat? And she was like, yeah. And she was she was deadly serious. And yeah. uh, I, I said to her, no, we eat lots of other things, uh, not just potatoes. Um, but she didn't really believe me. So she started to challenge me, you know, OK, well, what other things do you eat then? And I was like, look, yes. I'm not going to sit here and list everything that a British <laughs> person could eat. Just trust me, we eat more than just potatoes. Um, so, yeah, there are some of these, uh, you know, strange uh, opinions. That's perhaps one of the most extreme. But generally, well, I found that. Worryingly. Yeah, I've almost had the exact same conversation with someone uh, who then followed through with, I thought only China had rice, maybe Japan. Yeah, there's, 
food is perhaps one of the biggest confusions. Um, but generally speaking, I would say it's mostly that uh, the Chinese people I meet, they just don't really have any ideas uh, about British culture, which, again, I don't think is um, unusual. I imagine if you asked, you know, the the average, quote unquote, average British person to tell you something about China, they might go with Kung Fu, um, maybe calligraphy, and then they would probably stop after that. You know, the reality yeah. is, unless you're very interested in the cultures of other countries or you travel a lot or both, then, you know, you don't really have a lot of idea of what it's like to to be a British person or be a French person or a Chinese person living in those countries. Um, so, yeah, it, it's usually a very superficial understanding. Um, and from time to time, there are some very strange ideas which uh, um, get fixed in the minds of some people here. That's interesting. I was talking to uh, a local colleague who's very, very well educated, but she was complaining that some people say in the United States feel that China is really, really backwards. And she was like, but why do they believe this? Why don't they look this up on the Internet? And I said, well, how many countries do you look up on the Internet? Have you looked at <laughs> Brazil recently or Russia or India or El Salvador? I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, time. Yeah, it's I think that's important to remember. The reality is, you know, most people going about their day to day business are not that they're not inclined to, to to find out about the culture of some country that they've never visited and they're never going to visit. I mean, even, mm. uh, you know, uh, me, for example, I I would say that learning about other cultures is certainly an interest of mine. Perhaps I'd even go so far as to say it's, it's a hobby of mine and I've traveled a lot, but there are still mm. far more countries in the world where I know essentially nothing about the real culture than there are countries that I actually have a decent understanding, you know? So... Um, and the same with you. You've obviously traveled a lot. You're very interested in culture. But I'm sure I could probably, uh, you yourself could probably name many countries that you really don't know anything about, right? So if even people who travel a lot and have an active interest in culture are still quite ignorant about many countries, then I don't think we should be surprised that, you know, for the average person who who doesn't travel or something, that may well be quite ignorant about other cultures. Yeah, that's, that's fair enough. We don't all have the time, right? Yeah, and just just the the interest, you know. I mean, it's hard to know exactly what sparks one's curiosity, but there are many things that interest people which just don't interest me at all, right? Um, mm. So, I don't. I think sometimes, sometimes um, people act as if 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 an average person almost has a duty to understand other cultures. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily correct. I think if, you know, if you're going to be living in another country, then certainly you, it would be a benefit to you and the country that you're, you're going to live in if you understood the culture. But if you, you know, if you live in, in China and you've got no plans to leave China or ever go to France, well, how important is it for you to understand French culture? You know, um, likewise, if you're a British person and you've got no interest in China, you're never going to visit the country how important is it for you to understand the culture? Um, I think if you have an interest in the culture, definitely look into it, learn about it. Learning about cultures has certainly enriched my life, and I can imagine it would enrich a lot of people's lives. But at the same time, I don't think we should, um, I don't think there's any reason to look down on people who don't necessarily understand, wow, the cultures of other countries. Yeah, I think that's a very, very fair point. I mean, the name of the, the podcast is, you know, British Culture. Mm. And, and I've been asking a lot about kind of, relative to china because i often think that culture is best understood when we see something different and then often it strikes us oh that's that's different from my culture otherwise you might not think about it yeah uh, somebody in my office is from new zealand and they're asked what are some new zealand expressions you often use and he was like i i genuinely can't think of anything because it's not like i suddenly switch on my new zealand brain <laughs> it's all normal to me until i speak to you <laughs> exactly yeah um that reminds me of i i worked one summer in canada and I was working as a, a waiter in a, a restaurant there. And um, I'd worked in, in restaurants and bars before in the UK. And it was perhaps my second or third shift. And I asked somebody, where's the rotor? Right. I wanted to know, mm. you know, when my when my um, shifts would be for the coming weeks. And I said, where's the rotor? And they were like, the what? I said, the rotor, where's the rotor? And they you know, looked very confused and asked their friends. I was like, the thing that tells me when I'm supposed to be at work. And they were like, oh, the schedule. And I was like, well, yeah, the schedule, the rotor. <laughs> Um, but I would have never, if somebody had said to me, like, what's a, you know, what's a British English way of, of describing this thing that tells you when you're at work, I wouldn't have ever known that rotor was uniquely British English, whereas Canadians would say schedule, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would never have known that myself. I would have asked the same thing. And 
I've got to ask the, the final question. So you've been you've been teaching about British culture. You've been enjoying learning about not just Chinese culture but Fujianese culture yourself. Mm. What does British culture now mean to you? That's certainly an interesting, and I think also a far more complex question than I think it appears on the surface. You know, because it, as I spoke about before, we we have to get into questions about well, what what is culture? What do we mean when we say what is British culture? Right. Um, well. I'll, I'll perhaps, perhaps have to disappoint you and your listeners by saying I'm not totally sure. I don't think I can provide a totally satisfactory answer to that question. But perhaps by talking about it, we can move a bit closer to the answer, right? Um, well, I certainly don't think it's any one thing. I don't think there's one thing that we could say that, uh, you know, if somebody does this or if somebody enjoys this, then this is British culture, right? Um, I think it's... It's obviously a combination of things. However, it can be a different combination of different things. <laughs> so let me explain, right? We obviously have the, the big things that we know uh, as expressions of British culture. So tea drinking, um, cricket, football, right? Uh, well, I actually prefer coffee to tea and I don't like cricket or football. So am I not British? Do I not... Um, <laughs> You know, do, do I not do I not enjoy British culture? Well, obviously I am British, and of course there are many things about British culture which I I embody and I enjoy. So that's what I mean by it's it's multiple things, but it can be different things to different people. But you see, the problem with going down that path is then we can. Um, it, it's quite easy from there to say, well, if it's multiple things and it can be different things to different people, then really there is no such thing as British culture. But of course, that's not true either, right? Uh, mm. I think that British culture is, it's a bit like when you go into a shop and somebody says, can I help you? And you say, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'll, I'll know it when I find it, you know? And I think that, um, yeah. I think that's uh, British culture is something like that. So perhaps we can work backwards and we can go more towards the, what we could possibly consider the fundamental roots of these more well-known expressions of British culture. Um, and I think at the heart of British culture, I think that British culture rests on a certain kind of attitude of British people, which has developed as a result of the UK's unique uh, historical circumstances. And I think that a lot of uh, British cultural products um, or British cultural behavior is rooted in the fact that the British are, in the technical sense, very conservative. And I don't mean that in the political sense. I'm not trying to say that British people are more you know, naturally inclined to vote for a conservative political party. In fact, they're obviously not. We have you know, left-wing parties and you know, left-wing political platforms get plenty of support in the UK. I mean it in the sense that British people have a, a strong and quite clear sense of the things that they value and the things that they love and that they want to conserve for themselves and for future generations. Um, and I think this comes out as cultural expressions and manifests in ways that perhaps your, uh, your, your listeners would be familiar with. So for example, when you ask uh, a British person to, to think, if you said to an average British person, a British person living abroad perhaps, close your eyes and think, think of the UK, the image that's likely to pop into their head is probably not going to be Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament. It's most likely going to be something like a small village, you know, a church spire, mm. rolling green hills in the background. And I think that sort of image of, of the UK, which is rooted um, in our history, you know, because today, of course, the vast majority of Britons are are urban. But nevertheless, this 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 attachment to the land, this idea of of the UK as being being a home rooted in place in the land, you know, is a very powerful uh, idea amongst British people. Um, it's expressed in the de facto national anthems of, of England and Wales, for example, you know, the, the national anthem of England uh, being Jerusalem, where in the chorus it says, and we'll build Jerusalem on England's green and pleasant land, you know, mm. uh, and the, the Welsh anthem, um, oh, it slipped my mind. Uh, but I remember the, the line is, uh, 
to do with the mountains of Wales. Sorry, I'm, I'm English, not Welsh. So <laughs> okay. My knowledge of the Welsh national anthem is not so good. We are both proudly um, not Welsh, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's it. Um, so, you know, uh, and so when I say that the the, the British are, are quite conservative and that comes out an expression of culture. So those those images, for example, of the, the, the typical um, British small village, right? Those villages, they exist today. And they are often many hundreds of years old and they exist because of British people's conservatism, because British people want to conserve this this uh, physical build environment and uh, access to to the land. Um, They value it for something above and beyond its utility. And we talked about comparing uh, the UK to China, for example. Well, it's not to say that there, there aren't Chinese people who are conservative in this in this kind of uh, meaning of the word. But nevertheless, if you look at China, what you'll find is that there, um, it doesn't seem to be nearly as strong an idea in Chinese culture as it does in British culture that we need to conserve uh, what is old um, and protect what has been around for a long time. And this is why China has been able to expand and develop in a way that the UK simply never could, nor do I think British people would ever want it to, because we see uh, some real value in these these old ways, right? And if you talk to somebody who's not British about British culture, they often have this idea of traditionalism, right? Maybe even being a bit old fashioned. And the truth that exists in those ideas comes from the fact that British people want to conserve, you know, these more uh, traditional ways of life. I think this was articulated quite well by Edmund Burke, the philosopher who, when he was writing uh, his reflections on the revolution in France, was critiquing the social contract theories that were very popular at the time. The social contract theories, um, which are still popular, by the way, and, uh, you know, across continental Europe, is the idea that society is essentially a contract between the uh, between individuals in the society and between the governed um, and those who govern them. And Burke famously said that if society is a contract, it's a contract that binds not only the living, but also the dead and the yet to be born. And that is to say, of course, not a contract in any commonly understood uh, meaning of that term, but rather society is binded um, by loyalty and senses of duty, which don't just extend to the people that we know today, but go back into history, you know, to our most ancient ancestors and also continue forward to our descendants who are yet to be born. And that might all sound quite academic to uh, to your listeners. And I, and I dare say most British people would probably not have thought <laughs> about that if you asked them about British culture. But I'll give you an example of how that manifests in a very um, obvious, stereotypical example of, of British culture. And that is queuing, right? The British are famous for being great queuers. And uh, of all the stereotypes about British people, I can say that absolutely that is one of the true ones. We are really, really great (laughs) at queuing. Um, If you travel around the world, you will be surprised at how bad (laughs) many other nations are at queuing. You know, the British will even queue for a bus that has not yet arrived, right? We'll we'll spontaneously get into a queue (laughs) to get onto a bus that hasn't yet arrived. And... I think that's an expression of this uh, this conservativeness and this sense of loyalty and duty to the unwritten rules that bond and have always bonded our societies. And what I mean is, imagine it this way, right? If we looked at getting onto a bus solely from a utilitarian perspective, well, then there isn't much of a good reason to queue. If you're the bigger person, right, if you're physically imposing, well, you benefit greatly by pushing to the head of the line, right? Um, Mm. What's more, there is no actual contractual agreement making you have to get into the queue. There's no law in the UK that that says you have to queue, right? No one agrees um, at some point in their life to always follow the law or follow a rule which says they must queue. Right. So there's no contractual obligation to queue. There is, in fact, plenty of benefit to the individual by not queuing. Yet, nevertheless, almost every single British person will queue and follow the, you know, the uncodified rules of queuing. And that's, I think, because British people have this perhaps unconscious for many um, sense of the importance of duty and loyalty that you do things just because they are done. 
right? You don't mm. need to be able to necessarily articulate or show where it is written down that things must be done. That we're we're happy to act in a certain way because it's the way that we have always acted. Um, and I think that is one of the reasons why we're so good at queuing, because it's just the way it's done, right? Why do we queue? We yeah. can push the line, it would be easier. You don't have to queue. Well, we queue because it's what's supposed to be done. And I think that sort of attitude, which I would say the the majority of British people have, although I, I think the vast majority of them would have it you know, subconsciously, is one of the foundation blocks which leads to the more obvious expressions of British culture. You know, the fact that we, like I said, queue very well, or the fact that despite despite the fact that now in the UK you can get coffee from all over the world, you could get Roy Boss or Mate or any other kind of hot drink you want, nevertheless, we're committed to our tea with a splash of milk, right? I think um, yes. it's this, this innate conservatism not in the political sense, but this idea of doing things how they've always been done and teaching or at least helping those who come after us to understand that there is there is value in keeping things the same, even if that value can't quite be articulated. You know, why why does it matter that we retain uh, you know, the old village church that no one uses anymore when we could knock it down and we could make some new apartment blocks, which would uh, be very valuable and would increase the local GDP. You know, uh, there's a clear economic benefit to this. Well, we just like the old church. It's been there for a very long time. It doesn't matter that nobody uses it anymore. We like it. We want it to remain there and we want it to still be there for our grandchildren, and our great grandchildren. And I think it's that um, that kind of conservatism, uh, conservatism, uh, which is one of the root causes of uh, what many of your listeners would be familiar with when it comes to British culture. I think you've really hit on something important there. So I used to work in a language centre in the UK and we'd have students from over 100 countries. And actually, when you talk about queuing, I'm thinking of so many of my international students, like one of them, these people were queuing and they, they didn't queue. And what they said, I found very interesting. They said, nobody said anything. Like all the British people were queuing mm. and nobody said a word. They didn't stare, <laughs> but they just got this feeling of wrongness. <laughs> yeah. And so they ended up queuing with the British people because it's kind of what everyone else was doing. <laughs> <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. Um, and I really think that is, you know, um, as I said, because it is so difficult to say what is Britishness or what is British culture to, to pin it down to a certain kind of, you know, cultural product or a certain expression of culture. But if we work backwards, I think... That is one of the the root causes of of you know what manifests as British culture is that sense of duty, um, sense of of loyalty, uh, and doing things just because they're done. We don't always need an expression. I mean, uh, although I don't certainly don't want to make this political, nor do I think it is political. But I think this is um, one of the reasons, for example, where we're the only country really. Uh, depending on how you define it, with the exception of Israel, um, which has an uncodified constitution, you know, and that, yeah. that seems quite odd. Well, it is odd. I mean, it's certainly the exception. It also, uh, on first glance, you say, well, how do you organize your country? Well, why are things done the way they're done? Why, you know, why is it that the why is it that the prime minister has to sit in the House of Commons and not the House of Lords? It's just like, well, that's just how things are done. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just how things are done. And we're happy to keep them that way. We don't and we, we don't necessarily need to have it all written down. We don't necessarily need to understand it. Like with the queuing, you know, it's just how it is. I once met a British constitutional lawyer who said the joy of his job was you start studying and you just never stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and, and I think it can be very frustrating. I mean, it, it takes a certain kind of mindset, right, to uh, yeah. to accept that. Um, but it, it can be frustrating to the, the kind of person who wants things a bit more uh, explained um, mm -hmm. to stop at that position of, well, we just do it that way because it's always been done. Well, wouldn't there be an easier way to do it? Well, maybe, you know, but maybe maybe that easier way won't work out. You know, the fact is it's been done this way for a very long time. It's served us pretty well. So we'd like to keep it that way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very good explanation of what is Britishness. There's definitely something in that cultural cultural conservatism mm. um that's really interesting yeah it's it's um i think so and I, I think also as well if you if you lean more towards uh that kind of foundational interpretation 
Mm. It allows you to better understand uh, many of the more famous expressions of British culture, or perhaps even the less famous British uh, expressions of British culture. So I'll give you an example. Um, I wrote an article for my WeChat subscription account um, about tattooing and tattoo culture in the UK. Now, this is mm. something that Chinese people, at least the Chinese people I spoke to, were completely unaware of. I mean, their idea of the British gentleman, you know, is the 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 well-dressed man with his hair well done, um, you know, perhaps the most stereotypical kind of bowler hat and, uh, you know, umbrella. It's not yeah. a person with tattoos on their forearms, right? That's not what they would mm -hmm. usually think of, uh, especially in China, which is quite conservative, although not as conservative as some East Asian countries, but quite conservative with, with its opinions about tattooing. Um, they certainly didn't, they didn't know that actually uh, the UK is one of the most tattooed countries in the world. But what's interesting about British tattoo culture is it's deeply embedded in our historical uh, circumstances. So, you know, it was uh, the Romans, of course, pointed out that the Picts, uh, the, the inhabitants of what is today Scotland, um, were covered in tattoos, right? Anglo-Saxon kings, of course, the Anglo-Saxons, you know, created, uh, invaded and then created the state of England. Um, Anglo-Saxon kings were believed to have tattooed their faces. And the, uh, the original British explorers who went out um, you know, on you know, circumnavigating the globe and so on, came back with tattoos from uh, from Polynesia. And uh, also um, noblemen who would go and do pilgrimages to Jerusalem would come back with tattoos uh, of, you know, um, St. George, for example, or the crucifix, the crucifix and so on. Um, so it's, it's very much embedded in our culture. It's not this new new thing or new expression, right? It, it's It's deeply rooted. Uh, in British culture, which is why I think it's so culturally acceptable today in the mm. UK, whereas in, in uh, many other countries it's not. And you see, or for many people, if they think of a tattooed person, particularly if you go to someone like Japan or Korea, they think of a gangster, right? Whereas in the yeah. UK, I mean, you can be a very middle class, you know, uh, nice kind of person and, and have a tattoo and nobody would think anything of it, right? Um, yeah. So I think to be able to understand that, you know, if, if you're explaining this to, say, you know, a Chinese person or somebody from East Asia who has these quite negative opinions of tattoos, to be able to explain, well, we don't consider it to be weird in the UK, um, it helps to understand that the reason we don't consider it weird is we don't consider it to be radical or revolutionary. In fact, we consider it to be quite mundane because it's been a part of our culture for so long. Yeah, that's that's really interesting point going back to the history of tattoos. I met a gentleman who had all kinds of tattoos on him, but every one had a special meaning. Some of them were Viking runes and some of them were kind of Latin from the Romans and some of them were Anglo-Saxon designs. But he was actually kind of tattooing the history of England onto himself. <laughs> yeah, that's that's quite interesting, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, tattooing has taken a, an interesting course um, recently where it's become more and more associated uh with this kind of, uh, what would you call it, hipster type culture, right? Which I think is, oh, yeah. uh, is quite new. It, it wasn't, although as I say, tattooing has been relatively mundane in the UK for quite a long time. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago that it was still mostly reserved for the working classes. Uh, whereas mm. now tattooing has become quite a middle-class endeavor, I think. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And even traveling to say other English speaking countries, a friend of mine uh, is from London and he worked in the US for a time. And in one of the states he went, uh, the company he worked for politely asked him to wear long sleeve shirts um, so that his tattoos wouldn't show. It was giving some of his uh, clients the wrong impression of him. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Uh, it's, it is it is funny. And I think it's easy. Uh, again, we, we spoke earlier about, you know, um, what does the average person know of the culture of another place? You know, the average Briton probably isn't aware that actually there are still so many countries in the world where tattoos are viewed very negatively. You know, the average mm. Briton probably thinks that, OK, maybe some countries view it more negatively than the UK. But I guess in the modern world, most people are OK with it. When in reality, um, you know, Japan, of course, is the... Uh, the archetypical example of this, perhaps, but you know, in Japan, you'll still be refused entry to, uh, to certainly to public baths, uh, many swimming pools, and, mm. and other places if you have even a small visible tattoo. You know, absolutely. Ah, so there <coughs> yes, we go into these so, cultural differences, and it's the day to day, day to day stuff. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, and and that's where for me, I find you know a real great deal of interest why i can't see myself ever getting bored about learning about other cultures um and also learning about my own culture because mm. what you realize when you start to learn about cultures and you take this this view of 
of trying to understand what it's like to be, you know, a British person living British culture or a Chinese person living Chinese culture, is you realize that your experience is almost certainly not entirely representative of every British person, right? So that's mm. been an interesting thing for me when I've been writing these articles and making these videos is I've had to be really conscious of asking myself, well, hold on, is this really common in British culture? Or is this my personal unique experience of British culture, right? And it's been really interesting to find out, you know, um, to challenge your own assumptions of what you think British culture is versus what maybe other Britons think it is. And of course, neither of you are right or wrong. I mean, I'm a British person. I lived in the UK. So my experience of British culture is a true authentic experience. But it's just important to recognize that it's not the only true an authentic experience you know and there are other people that have very different experiences to me but those experiences nevertheless are experiences of real lived british culture okay i think that's, that's a wonderful wonderful place to leave it kane thank you very very much for joining me it's been a real pleasure no worries thank you very much for having me and um all the best with this podcast uh and hopefully when you get to episode you know 300 and you've got a million subscribers i'll be able to come back on and we can have another <laughs> chat sooner than that sooner than that i am <laughs> thanks very much have a great day Thank you. bye bye, -bye.